I mean, you're describing all the conditions that are set for a city that is in the subarctic to just burst into flames within hours. Um, there's this, I guess I'm trying to, trying to figure out how to talk about this. The, the severity of conditions, I, I think you can maybe describe it as being a one-off event, but as we were talking about before, you know, we're in 2023, this type of thing seems to be occurring on this scale in many different forms all around the world. Um, could you yeah. talk about the, that role that, you know, climate disruption is playing in setting many of these conditions? Yeah, for sure. Uh, Patrick, I think there was, there was a temptation to look at Fort McMurray as a one-off. Uh, it was such a freakish event. It was the largest, most rapid evacuation due to fire in modern times. It was in such a remote place. The conditions were so extreme. I think it was it would be easy for somebody just looking at that event to say, well, that's all so weird. It's such an anomaly. But then if you stop and just back up just a couple of years, go to 2011, four hour drive south of Fort McMurray was the little town of Slave Lake that was burned over by fire in the same way, same time of year, exact same conditions. Uh, 500 houses burned, the radio station burned, the library burned, the town hall burned, 15,000 people were evacuated. Um, the impact on the petroleum industry down there affected the province of Alberta's GDP at the end of the year. I mean, it was a really destructive fire. And people thought that was a one-off too. Hmm. And then uh, you go forward. Okay, so now we've got Slave Lake in 2011. You've got Fort McMurray in 2016, and that's just in Canada. Well, let's take a look at the Tubbs fire in 2017 in California. Then these incredible fires that burned through uh, Northern California and Oregon uh, and up into Washington in 2019 and 2020, um, epic fires. And, and what started showing up, and, and this is where, you know, this is another indicator of what I'm calling 21st century fire is not only do you have these ultra low relative humidities and excessively high temperatures that seem to be going together and, and accelerating already flammable conditions. Um, but you have these fire cloud systems called pyrocumulonimbus clouds, which were really, again, an anomaly and a curiosity as, as recently as the 1990s. And most commonly, you would see these giant whirling mm. um, uh, fire cloud systems that actually would you know reach up into the stratosphere. So we're talking 30, 40, 45,000 feet uh, up above uh, the surface of the earth so dynamic that they'd produce their own lightning they would generate hail um and with that lightning they could actually start their own fire so they became almost like a perpetual motion machine of fire mm -hmm. moving across the landscape and you know prior to the late 90s these pyro cbs as they're called pyrocumulonimbus clouds were generally seen only over volcanoes like that was the only uh explosive energy on earth capable of generating a, a firestorm system like this. Now they become an increasingly common feature, not just of boreal fires or of California and Oregon fires, but even of fires in Europe. And they've never been seen there before. And just to, to, to give you an, a sense of how far we've come in a very short time, Canada's fire season, the 2023 fire season, not only is the worst in the history of the country, um, it's only half over. Yeah. So we got a long way to go yet. And we've already, in Canada alone, generated over 100 pyrocumulonimbus firestorms. You know, these are huge things that you can see from satellites and mm -hmm. in space. And they, they change the world around them. And the idea of 100 of them occurring in half a summer in one country um, is unheard of. It's unheard of on planet Earth. So we're really in new territory. And... Back in 2016, as recent as it seems to us, it was clear to me then when I started looking at it and started talking to fire scientists that, wow, no, this, you know, Fort McMurray was not the first one and Slave Lake wasn't even the first one. There was another one before that that most most Canadians never heard of, most Americans never heard of called the Chisholm Fire that broke out in 2001. And that was the hottest, fastest moving wildfire ever recorded. Mm -hmm. uh, it produced more energy kind of per square meter 
which is how they me me measure uh, uh, fire energy along the leading edge, uh, per meter along the leading edge of the fire. It That fire, the Chisholm fire, produced more energy than any other fire ever measured on Earth anywhere. Not, you know, hotter than Australia, hotter than Southern California. So um, it was a monster. And, you know, you talk to fire scientists and firefighters about it, and it has a kind of legendary status. Um, and so so the writing was on the wall if you were looking on the right wall. Mm -hmm. And fire scientists and climate scientists have been talking about this and, frankly, warning us of this for decades, you know, really since the, the 1970s. They've seen this coming. And now it's really manifesting in ways that ordinary civilians like you and me can witness firsthand in some really terrifying ways. Yeah. Yeah, there's um aspect of this that it, that feels like it, it's we have crossed a, a threshold on the planet and that uh, this is like you're describing these uh, the fire weather, these conditions that when fires get large enough and hot enough, they produce their own weather, this sort of self-reinforcing thing. On the global scale, that seems to be some. It, it, I'm sorry, I'm trying to think of how to frame this. It, it feels like, actually, I was reading an article. I just wanted to actually bring this in. I was reading an article right before this interview started from the Guardian, and the title of it is "Canada Wildfires Have Already Doubled Smoke Emissions Record Set Last Year." Uh, and just very briefly, it states: Huge wildfires in Canada have already spewed out twice the smoke. Emissions than the previous whole year record, the EU's climate monitor said on Thursday, with the blazes wow. expected to continue to scorch their way through forests for weeks or even months. The devastating wildfires have burned some 30 million acres or 12 million he hectares this year so far, incinerating an area larger than the size of Cuba or South Korea. The point that it's really making, I think and it fits into what you wrote in your book, was just that we can talk about carbon emissions that we are producing from using, right. you know, right. for industrial activity, yeah. but we've crossed a threshold where the planet itself is producing the conditions for certain events like fires to also produce carbon and release methane and other greenhouse gases. Yeah. So that seems to be part of the trend as well. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's called a, a feedback loop, mm -hmm. you know, or a tipping point. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, the world's climate is enormously complicated and 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 very variable. Um, but what we've done over the past 150 years, by burning fossil fuels, everything from coal to oil and gas and methane and you know even bitumen processing, um, all of that together, performed relentlessly by very capable uh, and energetic human beings, has created enough CO2 and enough methane in the atmosphere to actually change the way the system works. So we're, our, our uh, lower atmosphere is now retaining measurably more heat than it used to. And when you heat anything up, um, it's going to dry things out. And, you know, one way to think about it, you know, this is what, you know, climate science is complicated, but it's, it, but it ain't rocket science. Uh, yeah. And when you uh, hang your, wet clothes out on the line on a cloudy, cool day, they're going to stay damp maybe for days. You put them out on a hot, dry, windy day, and they're going to dry in half an hour. And the forest floor is no different than that. And so when you have higher temperatures, and especially fair weather like we've been having uh, all summer uh, up north, um, things are going to dry out, not just your laundry, not just your local creek, but the forest floor, the trees themselves. And so to the point that if you walk through a lot of Canadian forests now, they crackle underfoot. They, it, it, you can just feel how dry it is. The leaves are crunching like late fall um, mm -hmm. uh, before the rains come. And so already we're in this really dry, um, you know, tinder, you know, it's a tinderbox basically, you know, type situation. And that's what... Um, uh, enhanced, if you want to call it that, uh, CO2 in the atmosphere uh, enables it, it. It makes that uh, more common and mm -hmm. uh, it makes those higher temperatures easier to achieve. And if you think about it, you know, fire can't burn through wet fuel. It needs it to be dry and it likes it to be hot. And so if it's already been dried out, if it's already hotter than normal, it, that's just less work 
that the combustion has to do to get the fuel up to temperature doing what it wants to do, which is to combust, to make fire, which dries out more fuel, which makes more fire. But basically, one way to understand this and understand, I think, the human connection to this is the reason we're interested in fossil fuels, whether it was coal or a piece of wood in a uh, a hearth from 10,000 years ago, or um, methane or propane or whatever's mm -hmm. in your lighter, um, we're interested in it because it burns. We're really into fire mm -hmm. as a species. And it's been our companion forever, longer than than dogs have been our companions. We've had a fire in our hearth, a fire, um, you know, in our world, uh, it, lighting up the darkness. You know, it's kind of a magical thing to do if you think about being a Stone Age person. And, you know, night falls and it's dark and there are a lot of big hungry creatures out there. But if you can illuminate the darkness with a fire that you control, all of a sudden you you are kind of re uh you're setting the rules of the game in, a, in, a, in your favor in a way that they weren't before. And so by mastering liquid fuel, as we have done, by creating combustion engines uh, and having piped in gas into our homes, again, we've taken this, uh, this next leap into energy and fire that has given us enormous power and enormous wealth. And we don't even think about it because we, you know, we, we, you and me and, and people much older than us have grown up in the middle of this experiment really with with liquid fuel and but at, at its root the point i'm making is at its root it's fire and so when you burn fire you make co2 it's mm -hmm. it's a natural byproduct you're going to have smoke you're going to have a carbon emissions you're going to have co2 and so when you burn as much fire as we have you can call it energy you can call it oil and gas but at its essence it's fire. When you burn as much fire as we have, you're going to produce measurable amounts of CO2. So in a way, it's not surprising that this CO2 has in turn made the earth more conducive to combustion. Like, mm. well, you wanted fire. You folks <laughs> wanted fire. Well, now we've turned the world into a more flammable place and it's easier to make fire. And it's not always fires that we want to have. And mm. that's what is alarming and feels almost like a betrayal. Um, but it's really uh, this disconnection that humans and the industry and its lobbyists and proponents and advocates um, have also enabled uh, is a disconnect between the power that fire gives us, which is fantastic. You know, I just took a really beautiful car ride today down to this really beautiful beach uh, on the Oregon coast, and I couldn't have done it without mm -hmm. uh unless i had an electric car which i don't mm -hmm. have at the moment so most of mm -hmm. us are going to be traveling in a petroleum vehicle powered vehicle to get down there but at the same time you know what is easy not to factor in because it's invisible and comes out the tailpipe where i can't see it uh is the co2 and yet you know there's billions of people like me motoring around right now and um it accumulates so mm -hmm. that's uh, that, you know, it go, goes back to the inconvenient truth. It's that, you know, what do you do with the waste? And mm -hmm. CO2 is a, is a now, um, it's its own industry. If you think about it, you know, if you have a fossil fuel industry, if you have a fire industry, if you have an energy industry, it means, uh, almost by default that you have a CO2 industry. So yeah. we're really good at producing CO2 and we produce so much now that, that we've really altered our climate in ways that are impacting us directly every day in yes. some ways more visible than others, but everywhere, you know, with very few exceptions is, is warmer than it has been and thus uh, evaporating more and more conducive to fire. Yeah. I, uh, since you're describing this or discussing this, this part of it, um, I was thinking about an interview I did in 2019 with Stephen Pine, is an excellent uh, and prolific environmental historian, writes a lot about fire. And in that interview with him, I think what was really the takeaway that stuck with me through these years is, through the years is that, you know, human beings, we co-evolved with fire, that the yeah. conditions that allow fire to exist are also the conditions that allow us to exist on this planet. And that without our sort of, I want to use quotations around the word mastery of fire, 
um, we wouldn't be human. We would not be the homo sapiens that we are today. Yeah. Um, and this brings in the question for me, and you, uh, in some ways you, you hinted at it or you more or less answered it in some way or the other, but it, the question of we think of ourselves as masters of fire, the same way that we're masters of all these technological innovations and the infrastructure that we operate and move through every day. Um, but are we really the masters of fire, yeah. especially in this situation, as you write about in minute and in captivating detail, the fire mm. that took over uh, Fort McMurray? It's it's a really crucial question. And, and you know, Stephen Pine is um, someone that anybody writing about fire goes through and encounters uh, on their way to better understanding of of this energy and, and its um, relationship to us. And, you know, I, one way I described it um, is as a prosthetic energy. You know, it's it's not a tool exactly, but we use it like a tool to mm -hmm. amplify our power, to multiply our energy, to multiply our wealth. Um, and so even though we don't see it, uh, its energy is there with us. And I'm sitting in a plastic chair right now that would mm -hmm. not be here, you know, without fire energy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm talking to you on this machine. Likewise, mm -hmm. it wouldn't be here without fire energy. And, mm -hmm. and it's so deeply integrated along with the petroleum industry, along with petroleum products into our daily lives that we scarcely notice it. You know, it's like, you know, it's I don't notice my fingers, you know, unless I wave them in front of my face, but I'm using them all the time. And I think that's how deeply fire and its energy has been integrated into into how we live. And so this question of have we mastered it, it does appear that way. But then if you take a broader view of planet Earth, the fact that um, we actually have a kinship to fire that I think is quite interesting in that it's the only reason we are able to exist is the same re only is the same reason fire is able to exist because of oxygen and that's something that unites fire and homo sapiens and, and really all living creatures um, on the surface of the earth anyway is that we burn oxygen we just burn it at different rates we also mm -hmm. produce waste gases you know human beings produce co2 human beings produce methane also we also generate heat you know, we don't think about it, but we're all walking around at almost 100 degrees. And the idea of a 100 degree day is daunting and newsworthy. But our own bodies are practically 100 degrees and we don't even think about it. But it takes a lot of energy. You've got to burn a lot of energy to be almost 100 degrees on a 60 or 70 degree day like I, you know, like I'm sitting in right now. Mm -hmm. So this question of um, who's in charge of this energy is a really interesting one. And Michael Paul, a, a really wonderful journalist and another kind of cultural historian, wrote a book called uh, The Botany of Desire that really shaped my thinking about fire. And it's a, a wonderful book that came out, I think, in 2005. And he looks at um, four plants. He looks at apples, potatoes, tulips, and marijuana. And he looks out at their very, very humble origins. I mean, they were practically weeds just growing in remote corners of the world until people discovered that they had qualities that human beings liked. And while we like this well enough that we're gonna breed it and help develop its power, whether it's a beautiful tulip or a really potent you know, strain of marijuana or a, a big juicy apple, and then we're gonna start propagating it around the world and, and, and selling it uh, and planting it. And so these are now global crops, but they started out locally. So the question is, who's uh, who's in charge? Is 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 the potato and the apple and the marijuana and the tulip using us to propagate it around mm -hmm. the world? Because without humans, they would still be in you know their little corner of the planet. Yeah. And you can ask the same question of of fire and and. I, you know, I call it, and this is totally riffing on Michael Paul and a, a domestication of desire. Mm -hmm. But who's getting domesticated? We think we've domesticated fire, but fire may be using us as these kind of zombie hosts to to uh, spread its energy and the CO2 necessary for its more rapid combustion um, mm -hmm. around the world. And so looking at it that way, we we are kind of the tools of fire. And so who's going to Who's going to be victorious in the end? Um, right now, you know, there are parts of the planet. I've heard that, you know, Tehran and 
and uh, some other cities in Iran have actually just had to shut down because it was simply too hot to function. Yeah. Uh, Phoenix, Arizona has been having these, you know, terrible temperatures where people have, you know, fallen on the sidewalk and gotten third degree burns off the sidewalk. So, um, and from even from hose water that's been sitting in the garden in the hose. So um, that's not a planet that is um, friendly to human beings, but it's mm -hmm. very friendly to fire. Mm -hmm. And so that raises, a, I think, a really serious question of, uh, are we serving fire or is fire serving us? And um, that's an open question right now. Yeah, and to build off of this, you know, the other question, and you ask this question directly in the book, which is, is fire alive? Now, one could sit here and look at a candle, a lit, a lit candle of a flame from a candle and say, well, that's not alive. Or you could look at, you know, your fireplace and see fire there. But there is a point, there are numerous points in the book when you're describing fire, that it's actually a character. You know, you're talking about the individuals that are escaping the fire, that are fighting the fire uh, uh, in, uh, in Fort Mac. And, you know, the fire itself is as much an agent of, almost of making choices and of choosing what it is targeting and what it is consuming. There are, I just want to bring this in and, um, it's one of the, it's just really a standout story in the just because of how kind of dramatic it is. I think his name is uh, Wayne McGraw. I think is his yeah name. Wayne yes. yes Wayne McGraw yeah yeah. So in, in in asking this question about is fire alive, I would ask that if you could how, however briefly or how long you want to get into this, describe his story and how he tried to fight the fire to protect his property, um, and how there was this point in this fight this single fight he was having by himself with this this huge fire as it's destroying his neighborhood um where the fire itself seems to have made this choice it, it's very eerie it is disturbing in a certain kind of way because there's like an intelligence there but it isn't quite it it's not biological in the yeah. way that we understand life to be yeah yeah it's 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 a provocative question and it's kind of an unscientific question and you know, no physicist or chemist would would go where where I went, but that's the you know the the joy really of being a a, a journalist is I can you know I can explore ideas that a that a someone in a tighter discipline um, wouldn't be able to, uh, and you know we need to determine right off the top that fire is not sentient. You know, it does not have a brain, it does not have intentions, but but it behaves in ways that look as if it does. And I think, you know, going back to the candle, going back to the fire in the fireplace, it's fire is not alive, but it's um, undeniably lively and mm -hmm. we like its company. And, you know, it's really nice to have a candle burning at the table. It just creates this atmospheric. It's not just warmth. It's light. It's energy. It's so many of the things that we associate with life. And then you think of the fire in the fireplace, you know, we spend time feeding it, tending it, nurturing it. It's like a little baby almost mm -hmm. that we take care of. Uh, and it gives us this beautiful, happy glow. And, you know, so much of our language is tied up in light and and fire and warmth. You know, so many of the things that fire gives us are what makes our lives, you know, meaningful. So uh, fire behaves in the, it's, it, it is an appetite. It needs to be fed and it will do whatever it's able to do to to feed itself more, to get as big as it can be. In that sense, it has ambition. It behaves in an ambitious way. And so this fire coming into uh, out of the forest and into the neighborhood of Abbasand, uh, where Wayne McGraw lived, um, it was looking for fuel it was responding to the heat it was responding to the off-gassing tar shingles the off-gassing vinyl siding the off-gassing glues and resins in the plywood it was heating up the um, propane tanks in the various grills in the neighborhood and exploding them it was burning all the tires you know all of this was fantastic fuel and energy for the fire so like it, it's like you know, letting a kid loose in an ice cream store, you know, it's just going to eat as much of it as it can of, of whatever it can. And so uh, Fort uh, Wayne McGraw 
unlike anybody else in his neighborhood, he decided to stay and fight the fire. Everybody else evacuated. You know, when this fire was coming in, it was so huge and so frightening. And the embers, you know, were igniting so rapidly on people's lawns that, you know, they grabbed their kids, grabbed their pets, and they booked it out of there uh, uh, post haste. And Wayne had, um, he's a, a guy, he was a welder. He's very familiar with fire. He had a, a, a hobby shop in his garage where he had, you know, full of snowmobiles and ATVs. And he had a, a muscle car and a big pickup truck and a jet boat and all these welding tools and welding tanks full of explosive gases. And so this was a world he was comfortable in. And it's a world that was also valuable enough to him that he was going to fight to protect it. So he's hosing down all the trees around him and everything around him is now on fire. And so he became a kind of island in the middle of the fire. And there, there was a prevailing wind that was drawing the fire northward through the neighborhood. And so the fire you know, went around him because he protect, protected his place so aggressively and for a time so successfully. And it kept moving northward through the neighborhood. And he said, and he's describing this to me, you know, the, the fire got it uh, about six houses down from him. And he thought, you know, I've done it. I did it. Hmm. Uh, and then he said, the fire crossed. And I, I said, what do you mean? And, and he said, it crossed the street and it came back up the street toward me. And so there's a prevailing wind in the fire, you know, that if you were in a plane looking at which way the smoke was going, it's all going north. Mm -hmm. But there were these vortices, you know, I think that's how a physicist would explain it. But there was also this unburnt fuel. And when you think of Wayne McGraw's garage full of acetylene tanks, full of snow tires and summer tires and gas tanks and, you know, everything, you know, a motorhead, you know, could desire, you know, there's a similarity. People who love machines, who, who love engines, you know, they like the fire energy too. And the, but the so does the fire. So okay. it's almost like the fire, you know, behaved as if, hey, I don't want to miss that. You know, that's going to be a feast back there. And so the fire basically progressed back up the street against the prevailing wind and burnt his place down. And um, that, you know, he got, he barely escaped with his life. Yeah. And, um, it just was such a surreal situation because you're really rooting for the guy, you know, and you think, yeah. my gosh, he's beat the odds. You know, yeah. he did this impossible thing. And yet the fire had these sort of other intentions. And again, you can't call them intentions uh, in, in, a, in, the, in terms of sentience. You know, it's not an intellectual decision, but it makes you think about how much how much are we driven and motivated and enabled by physics and chemistry. And that's what enabled that fire to make basically a U-turn on Abisan Drive and go the wrong way up the street and burn everything. And so it left nothing uh, uh, out. And uh, it's just um, an amazing anecdote, and it really makes you wonder. I mean, it has like mythological or legendary dimensions to it. I mean, the subtitle of the book is the making of a beast and they started calling it that a beast because of just how relentless and you know it's like an invader you describe you know the story of, of like Grendel from Beowulf you know this sort of monster that enters is not wanted it takes what it wants and leaves you know um it, it's hard for me to wrap my head around what is essentially a chemical process a fire making this that u-turn you describe it just it's I, I, I like I can get my head around other stuff like describing things that no one had ever seen before at that point, which was houses literally bursting and in, bursting into flames spontaneously, like instantaneously and disappearing within five minutes. Like that's crazy, <laughs> but it seems plausible with yeah. all the conditions that were set to try to imagine a fire taking a U-turn. It just, it, it, it implies, I know there's this, this sort of, um, what do they call it? Uh, anthrop anthropomorphizing or something. There's that that yeah. fear or that people don't want to do that. But there is this. It's almost like an uncanny valley, a feeling of this thing is not alive, but it is. And when it's on that scale, it is horrifying and does take yeah. on the characteristic of a mythological beast. Yeah. Well, yeah. we. I mean, we live on planet Earth, and mm -hmm. why we live. The, that, that verb why we're why we're able to 
articulate uh, that and have this conversation now is because of oxygen, because mm -hmm. of chemistry, because of physics. And fire is, you know, really different from us, but it's beholden to a lot of the same laws, which means it has a lot of the same powers that we do. You know, it, it's, it's, and, and the, the Greek word anima, as an animal, as an animated, uh, refers to the breath of life. And so when you think about a fire, you think about what drives, what's the breath of life in a fire? It's oxygen, of course. It's the same breath of life that we breathe. And it animates us and it animates fire. And fire is really animated. You know, that's mm -hmm. part of what's so mesmerizing about watching it in a fireplace or even in a candle. It's always moving. Mm -hmm. And when it's presented with that much fuel and, and that much available energy under those incredibly combustive conditions, it's going to get really, really dynamic. And it's going to have the same way um, in a hurricane, there can be tornadoes inside hurricanes. There are so many complex dynamics happening that when you have a fire system that big, likewise, you can have very bizarre behaviors that you know, fire scientists and physicists are beginning to understand. And they, you know, Mike Flanagan, for example, a, a really excellent fire scientist in Alberta now, I think he's teaching in BC um, at Thompson Rivers College. You know, he could probably explain the type of vortice, vortex that would cause, a, enable a fire to turn on itself and go back up the street. But, you know, it's following the fuel, it's following, you know, air currents, it's following a bunch of different things. When you look at, uh, especially in the case of Fort McMurray, which was so unusual, the way the fire went through town and then came back from the other direction the next day. It's like, I didn't finish the job. There's mm -hmm. some more I want there. So what we saw happen in microcosm on Wayne McGraw's street happened on a citywide scale over many days. You know, And that's what's another amazing feature of 21st century fire is and that we saw you know in in sort of its full and terrible glory in, in fort mcmurray is you know it didn't just burn through in a day it didn't you know most fires you know they're they're following the wind uh they race through in one direction and then they're gone they go off into the mm -hmm. forest they, mm -hmm. they or they go out you know they hit a lake they hit an ocean whatever it is this fire went through and then came back day after day and that's another reason why it was called the beast because the fire started you know came into town on the third it didn't get named the beast until the fifth. Well, that's 48 hours of relentless firefighting from every direction on the compass. Mm -hmm. And it starts to feel like, wow, this thing is out to get us. Mm -hmm. uh, and it it's an apt description. You know, it's not a beast in the sense of Godzilla or Grendel. It's not three-dimensional, but it's having an absolutely three-dimensional impact mm -hmm. on the city in terms of destroying property um, wholesale. Yeah. And so, um, again, it's, uh, you know, fire occupies this kind of interesting niche of being almost alive, but not quite. And I really wanted to explore that um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. intensely because I think fire is something we it will it behooves us to understand better, to have a more nuanced uh, concept of as we go into the 21st century, because we're going to be seeing a lot more of it. That's right. And um, we should yeah. know who we're seeing. Mm -hmm.